Thank you, Tina. And now we have Melanie Swearingen, who is the fairly new now director of the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Tonight I have three exciting events to tell you about that's coming up in our community. Um, the first one is February 28th. We have the Mount Lugo Luge um, tubing competition, and then also the Colorado's Taste over at Colorado's Best Beer. So check out our website, goconifer.com, for more information on that. It'll be a lot of fun for the community. We have team competitions and family competitions, so all that information is online. Um, we also have the annual awards coming up, where we're going to celebrate um, some of the business Cutie. leaders and our community leaders that really have made an impact on our community in the past year. So that is March 13th. Um, nominations are going in now, so be sure to log on to goconifer.com and get a nomination in for your best uh, favorite local business or favorite volunteer in the community. Um, and then we also have our scholarship that I wanted to tell you all about. We have this year two scholarships of $1,500 that we are going to be awarding to two seniors from Conifer High School um, that are in the business program there. And so that's an exciting, last year I think we did one at $1,500, and the year before that was one at five, or 1000 excuse me. So we're very excited to be able to increase the number of kids we're able to support and also the dollar amount. So that is it for me, thank you very much. Thanks, Melanie. Um, Chamber's always so so busy doing so much. Okay, next we have Peter Barkman. He is um, now our Conifer Area Council advisor, and uh, he's going to give just a little bit of a brief update about the development updates. Thank you, Shirley. Yeah, there are probably three important things that are coming up uh, in, the, in the handout of this, what's going on. Uh, there's the ongoing Conifer 285 uh, community plan that Heather Guthbillis is working on. She just had a meeting on the uh, activity center for the Aspen Park Con uh, Conifer area, and now she's scheduled one for the Pine Junction area. And that'll be March 3rd at Elk Creek Elementary School Cafeteria at 6.30 p.m. Uh, I would suggest you go onto the website and look up the documents that are in there. She's got a lot of information, a lot of maps, and she really is eagerly looking for people's input. Uh, and it looks like Lauren may have some of the maps in the back there. The other uh, developments that are uh, pending in, in everybody's mind, I'm sure, the hurt is the uh, there's a commercial development where uh, there's a proposal to uh, build 15,000 foot square foot uh, specialty retail in the vacant lot that's next to the Sonic. That's the kind of for town center block two. Uh, we understand that's going to be a, or it's intended to be a, a natural grocery store of sorts. Uh, however, what we're hearing from the county is that they are uh, going to hold back approving anything for the Conifer Town Center until the owner and the uh, water district make the improvements they need to make to Main Street and the retaining wall. Nothing will get passed until those are taken care of. So it's a good impetus for the owner to, to do some work if he wants to get tenants into some of that land. So stay tuned for that. It's uh, been going through uh, the second referral, review of the planning and zoning, but it'll probably stall until the improvements have been made. The other one that uh, we've all been hearing about in the, uh, is the, uh, it's listed in here as Iowa Gulch Road. It's also been known as the uh, Homestead uh, Park. ODP and its uh, proposal, this would actually downgrade the number of housing units from 26 to 22, but it includes a ski hill and sledding trails. Uh, this is next to the homestead you see when you drive down 285. That one is also in its uh, referral. It's in the second referral. All the comments are in. They're being reviewed. Uh, a uh, planning commission hearing has not been scheduled, but you'll want to pay attention and see when that happens. As soon as we hear, we'll post it on the website. Um, the uh, case manager for that is no longer Aaron McLean, it's Russ Clark. So if you're interested, you might give Russ a call. I think what we all really need to pay attention to is whether they have a water plan that would uh, allow them to do snow making, if that's really in their, uh, in, in their crystal ball for that area. Uh, being able to make snow there, they would require a source of water, which if they're going to use local water, they'll need water rights for it, and that's not an easy thing to do. 
But I think that's what people need to pay attention to is what their proposal is on that. Again, it downgrades from 26 to 22 houses, so there are two ways to look at this. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then we have Brian Mosby to talk about the Conifer Library. Brian. Thank you. I'm Brian. I'm your friendly neighborhood librarian. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I brought a bunch of flyers along with different programs that were going uh, going on at the library, our story time, the library club, and things like that. Uh, but there's three in particular I'd like to point out that are going on. Uh, the first one, if you know any kids that uh, or have any reading skills whatsoever, they want to practice their reading skills, we have a pause program going on. And what that is, a volunteer comes into the library with her pet dog, Harvey, and the dog just lays there and listens to your child read. It's a great, safe environment for kids to just practice their reading. So that's an excellent one. We do that the second and third Tuesdays of each month at 4 o'clock. Uh, let's see here. The, with the help of the Mount Resource Center, uh, we brought the program Active Parenting of Teens to the library. It started last week. It is a six-week program. So if you're interested in you know, parenting philosophy and skills and things like that, uh, particularly with teenagers, uh, that's going to be going on for the next five Thursdays, so into March as well. Uh, that's at 6 p.m. on those Thursdays. And you, it does build on itself. However, the first class, I'm sure you can catch up uh, really well, and the uh, teacher's great there. So. The other one is a system worldwide program. Uh, it's called Book a Librarian. It's through all the Jefferson County Public Libraries. And what it is, is if you need personalized research help, uh, you can go onto our website, has the address there, and you can schedule a time with your very own librarian. And they will come from whatever library you pick at whatever time you agree upon. And they can help you with any of your research or uh, if you need help with technology or your personal devices or things like that. And they'll sit with you for 30 minutes and you get that personalized one-on-one -on -one attention. So the library's librarians come to you now, all right? Uh, and then I have all sorts of other flyers over there, too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. And um, now we have our newly elected representative, uh, John Kaiser. He's going to give a little bit of a legislative update. All right, thanks, Shirley. How's everybody doing tonight? Thanks for, thanks for coming out. Uh, being here at the town hall. Um, yeah, well, we're already 25% of the way through the legislative session. You can believe that uh, we're going fast. So uh, it's the first time I've had an opportunity to talk to everyone uh, since I've been sworn in. And again, my name is John Kaiser. Um, and so thanks for electing me and working hard down there to uh, help make sure that our district is well represented. And I'll share a couple of things with you that uh, I'm working hard on right now. And uh, you know, there's about 600 bills that will make their way through the legislature this year. Uh, 120 days, so uh, it's kind of like drinking out of a fire hose a little bit. Uh, but uh, a couple of things that I'm working on um, in, uh, in coordination with Mountain Area Land Trust, uh, we're working on a, a bill I think that's going to really uh, help us uh, ensure we've got uh, uh, more access to open space and that will allow um, people to put their, uh, put their land into trust and reduce transaction costs. Um, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a legal change, it's a technical change, but really what it's going to do, um, and, and really I think why uh, Mountain Air Land Trust supports it uh, very, uh, very heavily is uh, because it's going to uh, really cut down on the costs for the landowner that uh, wants to see their uh, land put into uh, open, into the open space status and preserved for, uh, for perpetuity. So, uh, second thing uh, I'm pretty excited about too is uh, we're working on uh, a statewide bill uh, that's got uh, a lot of support, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty neat to get uh, urban legislators and uh, in the mountain communities and uh, people out in the eastern plains all agreeing on stuff. I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, it's a bill that's uh, dealing with um, having the state, state spend some more money on uh, trails, and that's something that uh, I think is really uh, important here in our, in our communities. It's important to my family and, and to many of you as well. Uh, uh, we know that. Uh, we're kind of the playground, really, for, for the metro area. And I kind of tease some of my uh, colleagues uh, from down in Denver because they always tell me how they come up. And, you know, they come up to Concord, they come up to Morrison or Evergreen, and, uh, you know, and they, uh, 
they drive up, they bring their bikes, uh, you know, they, they ride around and they go home. But uh, anyway, uh, they're using the trails and we want to make sure that uh, you know, they're helping us take care of them and, and that we can uh, have more access as, as a community. Uh, but uh, uh, had a couple of great bills that uh, have sailed through uh, with unanimous support. Um, in the House so far, uh, a couple of business bills. One actually was a, was a pretty interesting one that some of you will find a little bit humorous, hopefully. Um, we have a lot of laws in Colorado. Uh, you know, it's uh, enormous when you look at the number of statutes that we have. And, uh, uh, uncovered a, a, a section of law that dealt with some um, antiquated licensing requirements on retailers and uh, people who were taking admission for entertainment really broad. Um, and it said the county commissioners had to uh, issue these licenses, and it was like you know, $5 to issue a license. And if you didn't have one, it could be punishable by up to six months in jail. And uh, it turned out, well, we did a lot of research, and this is from the 1800s, and um, not a single county was issuing these licenses, but it was still on the books. So we have a, a lot of potential uh, violators of, of a law that, uh, you know, by the way, exempted uh, purveyors of uh, you know, goods and sundries and mining tools and things like that. But, uh, so some of that's clean up, uh, certainly. And uh, another bill that I uh, had that's already over in the Senate now is a, um, is a, a, a I think a business friendly bill that uh, is a clarification and a, uh, a technical change to uh, the merger statute we have in Colorado's corporate code uh, dealing with what happens when two businesses uh, merge. And uh, I think that'll wind up saving some Saving some lawsuits in the future. It's, something, it's an issue that's been litigated uh, heavily in a couple of other states. And, um, so that's something that you know, I think is a common sense thing that we can do. And, and I always like it when we have common sense things move through because uh, you can tell what they are uh, pretty easily by looking at the books. You know, when, when you have two bills go through unanimously um, as a freshman, I, I was very, very uh, excited to see that happen. Um, those are over in the Senate. And I think those will get uh, approved by the Senate in short order. But, I uh, want to just say thank you for, uh, I know there's probably a number of people in this room who uh, have reached out to me in, uh, in, in email or, or calling the, the, the office down at the Capitol. Um, I'll share with you that last week alone, uh, I got a thousand emails um, on uh, just you know, various bills that are going through the legislature. Um, so uh, if you are uh, contacting me, uh, I, I would ask you to make sure and put your name and you know, let me know, you know you're from Conifer. You know, you're from uh, House District 25. It's important. Um, you know, we get emails from all over the state, and certainly with uh, uh, you know different software programs, people are able to you know, email uh, the entire legislature and, and just kind of you know, fill people's inboxes. But uh, you know, I, I certainly commit to getting back to each of you, uh, you know, when you when you reach out and email me. So uh, if you do that, I, I will we'll definitely get back to you, and, and I appreciate um, the. Uh, Know, always the, the communication and the effort that um, so many of you put into uh, watching what's going on down through the Capitol because it's uh, it moves fast. It does. Uh, like I said, 600 bills will probably uh, wind up uh, being introduced, and, and we'll uh, work on all that stuff right now. But uh, 22 billion dollar state budget. It's a, it's, it's enormous. Um, so if you, if you have questions, if if you uh, uh, you know, want to just let me know how you feel, please do um, send me an email. I'll leave some cards in the back. Unfortunately, I've got to run home. Uh, my wife's pregnant, and, and she's got, she's been really having one. He said it's really bad. I've got a dog that was at that all day. He was sick, and i got to go put my daughter to bed. But, um, thanks for, uh, thank you, Shirley, for having me. I appreciate it, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys. Thank you, John. Okay, next we have Josh Liss, who is the IREA Public and Regulatory Affairs <coughs> Director. He's going to talk about the role of traditional and renewable energy in today's power mix. So, hopefully we can bring that up quickly here.
before I start, how many of you, when you click on the light switch, or turn on your microwave, or any other electrical appliance, stop and think about where does my power come from? Here we go. Okay. How many of you think about it when the power goes out? <laughs> Everybody, right? Um, but not only where does it come from, IREA, but where does the how is the power actually generated? Can anybody in the audience tell me, just shout it out, where do you think most of our electricity in this country comes from? Coal. 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 Boy, that was an easy one. That's right. Um, and I will start by apologizing because some of these may be hard to see, but I'll go through them. Um, Shirley has warned me and tasked me that I should talk about our power mix in a non-controversial way. Um, which is a challenge in and of itself. How many of you have had an IREA representative speak or heard an IREA representative speak and maybe it was a little less non-controversial? Okay. I'm not that guy. Okay. We're just going to go over some of the basics on where our energy mix comes from in the country, in the state, and what we're looking at in the future. So yes, in the United States, 39% uh, of our energy, approximately, comes from coal. 27% natural gas, nuclear 19, hydropower 7, other renewables 6, uh, petroleum about 1%. In Colorado, coal is 64%, approximately, of our energy mix. Natural gas 20%, wind 14, hydroelectric 2.4, Solar, less than 1%, and geothermal almost doesn't register. But in total, as a country, 67% um, of our energy mix comes from fossil fuels. As a state, 84% of our energy mix comes from fossil fuels. That's coal, natural gas, petroleum. Uh, that's our current energy mix. And there's charts that are probably not any easier to see, that kind of breaks it down, but you see the large portion here, coal, natural gas, nuclear, renewables. Now, <clears throat> times they are changing. How many, is there anybody in the audience who has solar or participates in another renewable energy program? Excellent, excellent. We're seeing more and more of that in IRA's territory. Um, much of it is voluntary, but we're also seeing some regulation. Um, just briefly, some of the highlights. In 2010, the Colorado General Assembly enacted the Clean Air and Clean Jobs Act. It was the retirement or retrofit of over 900 megawatts capacity of coal-fired um, power plants into natural gas calling also for an 80% reduction in nitrogen oxide. Clean Air, Clean Jobs was a big piece of legislation for the state of Colorado that had, has had impact on our state and continues to have impact on our state. I'll move into that in a little bit. Next, Senate Bill 252 in 2013. How many are you, of you are familiar with Senate Bill 252 and what it does? How many, how many of you read the Watson Bolts? I'm a little biased. I help write, I help write Watson Bolts. So read your Watson Bolts. It's good stuff. Um, Senate Bill 252 said that for rural electric co-ops that are over 100,000 meters in size, <coughs> which basically is tri-state and IREA in Colorado, we need to have at least 20% of our energy come from renewable energy sources by the year 2020. The previous standard was 10%. Currently, IRA is roughly around 13%. We fully anticipate that by 2020, we will meet this standard of 20%. Um, of that, 1% needs to be distributed generation. Can anybody... Tell me what distributed generation is. Okay, one of our board of directors is in the back of the future. 
distributed generation essentially is generation not from the power plant. It's distributed throughout the community, uh, such as the solar panels on your home or solar garden, uh, wind farm or wind generation, that sort of thing. Um, so that's Senate Bill 252, another regulation that is pushing us in a particular direction as a state. And then this last summer, the Environmental Protection Agency proposed what they are calling the Clean Power Plan. Uh, what it essentially does is call for a 30% reduction in CO2 emissions by the year 2030 nationwide. Um, this particular proposed rule calls for a state-by-state -state goal of CO2 carbon dioxide reductions, um, which we refer to in the industry as outside the fence regulation. It's inside the fence, usually is the EPA's purview. Um, and inside the fence is plant by plant, power plant by power plant. Outside the fence is now state by state. And it's saying state by state, we're going to set goals for each state to reduce CO2 emissions. Now the goal for Colorado in particular is around 35% reduction by the year 2030. The EPA proposed this rule in um, the summer of 2014, and the rule is set to be finalized in the summer of 2015. Uh, we've had several updates about it in our Watson Volts, and I expect you'll see several more. It is evolving. Um, they took public comment on the proposed regulation through last fall up through, I believe, December 1st, and the EPA is considering the literally millions of comments they got on this proposed regulation, and we'll see the final product sometime this summer. But we're seeing state and federal regulations that are moving us in a particular direction towards more renewable, towards less emissions. Um, and that is the trend that we are seeing. Now, IREA conducted a member survey last fall, um, and it was a follow up of a survey we conducted in 2011. We want to know what our members think. Um, the survey covered a lot of areas. Um, perceptions of IREA, our communications to our members, uh, different technology, what technologies would be popular with our members in terms of uh, what would they be likely to use, and knowledge and perception of IREA's priorities. Um, regarding our energy mix specifically, we had our members of the, the participants in the survey rank the association goals. Number one was a re reliable electric service. Number two, low cost. Number three, fast customer service. Number four, energy efficiency or energy saving tips. Number five, renewable energy. Six, energy efficiency subsidies. Seven, home energy audits. And eight, uh, charitable causes in, in the community. These are how the results came out. Um, and then when we asked the participants which of these goals do you think is most important, 49% uh, said keep costs as low as possible. Um, Intermountain REA is a rural electric co-op, meaning we are not for profit. Um, as members, I'm sure you all know, any the margins that we get uh, portions are returned back to our members as a not-for-profit co-op. 16% was the next highest with most reliable electric service. And then third, at 13%, using renewable energy sources. That goes on energy saving tips, fast customer service, home energy audits, and so on. And then we asked further questions regarding how to pay for renewable energy. With regard to the use of renewable energy sources, do you generally prefer to A, pay a little more for electricity from renewable sources, or B, keep costs low by using traditional sources? 37% said pay a little more, while 63% said keep costs low by using traditional sources. Now, I see some of you shaking your heads. Is this a false choice? Maybe. It may be. But we asked further questions. 
In your opinion, should IRA provide rebates to encourage customers to purchase solar panels for their homes? 67% of respondents said yes. The co-op should provide subsidies or incentives for solar. <laughs> then we asked, is it a good idea for IRA to pay more for energy for customer-owned solar facilities than it pays for energy it can obtain otherwise? And the, the results were reversed. So 67% said no, don't pay more for renewable. We don't want you to pay more when you can get energy elsewhere. And here is the challenge that we're faced as a faced with as a rural electric co-op and as a utility provider in general. We have right now our energy mix is roughly um, six five to six percent um, is hydroelectric energy from the Western Area Power Authority. We own, many of you know, a quarter interest in the newest and cleanest coal-fired power plant in Colorado, Comanche 3 down in Pueblo, that provides roughly 50% of our energy mix. And the rest of our energy comes at a wholesale rate from Excel Energy. We are a purchaser of wholesale power. Um, our only generation interest is in part ownership of that power plant, otherwise we're a regular distribution co-op. Because we get our power so cheaply, and because we have enough power to meet the demands of our customers, adding additional generation, whatever that may be, could be extra cost. And I say could be because there are ways that we are looking at right now to adding utility scale renewable energy to our energy mix that may come in at uh, a reasonable cost comparison relative to the rest of our energy mix. But the point being, we all need to take that into account as a, as a co-op and as a utility in how we are how we are stewards for our members' money in, in, in that we're not an investor-owned utility, we're not a for-profit company. Um, but I thought the, the results of the survey were interesting. The other thing that I think that it told us was I think people generally who responded to the survey would be more likely to install solar if there were rebates or incentives. But if those rebates or incentives cost them more as a member of the co-op, then maybe, maybe not. Um, and one thing I, I will point out, we don't offer rebates, we never have. Um, and it's because as a member of a co-op, when you pay your utility bills, any costs we incur go to our customers. And if we're paying some customers extra for one thing, it falls on the backs of the other customers. And so we have to be mindful of that. Um, keeping in mind, as you saw before, with the trends that we are going in and the direction we're going. Finding, finding balance is key. Um, and I know I need to wrap up, I just got the one minute. We need to find solutions that work on all the above energy strategy, using all of our resources and making sure that we're making sensible decisions that are not just based on cost, but not just based on ideology as well. We need to find that balance. And I think that's truly what we strive to do, what our board of directors strives to do. Um, we have to always consider cost, of course, and resource planning for utility is a long-term endeavor. Um, so I want to end quickly with just three thoughts, uh, or three plugs, I guess. One, we do offer free home energy audits. If any of you are interested, call our Sedalia office. We'll come to your house, set up a free energy audit, uh, help you identify ways that we can you can save money on your electric utility bill. Two. We are issuing capital credit refunds in March. Um, the Board of Directors has approved a $13.6 million refund this year. That's 20, over $29 million that we've refunded since January of last year to our members. So I want to announce that. You'll see those in March, mostly in the form of a bill credit. There are exceptions. Read your next Watson Bolts. It tells you all about it. And finally, I wanted to mention um, 
Mike Kempe is one of our directors on the board of directors, represents part of this area here. He's standing in the back in the blue shirt. He also works for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden and is um, an expert on all things renewable and especially solar. So I'll be around if you have questions um, at the end and certainly Mike will as well. Thank you for your time with that. Thank you, Josh. Very, very informative. That was great. Um, okay, next we have um, an update of the project place study. Um, that was, you've heard about it if you've been to our meetings. Um, it was the kind of recreation coalition. Um, and Mimi Mather is here. She is the principal with Root House, and that was the consultant that we worked with on that. Okay, here you go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tuthi Nemchek. <clears throat> and um, I had the honor of leading Project Place and representing our community. And while Mimi is setting that up, I'm sort of using time here. So bear with us just one second here. Um, but I did want to thank you all for the support that we received from the community, from Jefferson County, from the commissioners and funding the master plan. And I sincerely hope that you really appreciate and enjoy what we have to present tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Tiki. So, uh, a year ago, the Conference Recreation Coalition launched Project Place, and I stood up here and asked for your involvement. Now, I'm excited to say a year later um, that the plan is done, and I'm here to ask you to give it a good read. Um, I'm just going to take the next couple minutes to explain what, what's in the plan and hopefully um, whet your appetite so that you go home, download it, and ravenously devour it. So here it is. It's a strategy for improving recreation in the conifer area. Throughout the project, we've emphasized this is not another recreation district project. Instead, it's really, it's a document, it's a guide. The, the plan is intended to be a roadmap that folks like yourself, that residents, that organizations, that um, civic leaders can use to try to improve recreation uh, in the conifer area. People might say, why did we do it? So the answer is really, why not? Recreation is fun, it's healthy, um, it's going to improve the quality of life for those of you that call conifer home. So what's inside the plan? There are a set of toolkits, there's four of them. One that looks at promoting conifer's recreation opportunity, another one uh, that looks at building a more robust trail system, a third one improving outdoor recreation opportunities, and a fourth one looking at um, increasing the number of community gathering places. So the plan is chock full of checklists, um, of tips, of ideas from other communities. We've, we've borrowed, um, you might as well beg, borrow, and steal from others who have done things well in terms of promoting and um, increasing recreation in their communities, so we've done that. Uh, for example, here's a list of potential outdoor recreation events that, that somebody could, could run with here in the community. Um, Another big question when you do an ambitious, admittedly ambitious plan like this, we lay out a lot of ideas for the conifer area and, and it could take um, 10 years to, to get it done and a lot of questions, or a common question people ask is how are we going to fund it? And funding is addressed in this plan, um, there's strategies for funding it, there's also long lists like this one of potential grant sources. And it's more than just a plan. The Conifer Recreation Coalition, in addition to this document, has also created a website devoted to conifer recreation. So this is pretty cool, and again, I encourage you to log on. Um, if not later this evening, how about this week? So what the, what the uh, website includes is a list of recreation hotspots. So as, as part of the project, we asked you all at these town halls and other public meetings and through surveys, what do you like to do in Conifer? What, what are the best things to see and do outdoors? And from that input we received from you, we developed these recreation hotspot lists. So there's lists related to recreation destinations, to favorite trails, to annual events, and even to um, where to go for operating recreation libations. So again, lists that describe these, these different um, 
recreation destinations, and then links to Jefferson County open space and other places where you can get more detailed information. The idea is these lists are just the beginning. Um, the website has a place where you can contact Conifer Recreation Coalition and help us build those lists. S send your ideas. There might be a trail or an overlook that, that we didn't mention. We want to know about it. And then also on the website, you'll see that you can download the plan there. So again, I encourage you to do that. And that's, that's it. Um, again, our next steps is really for you to take this document and run with it and improve recreation in the Conifer area. So thanks. Thanks, Amy. You know, Conifer Area Council has done three major surveys. Um, I'm sure that most of you have, have um, you know, taken those surveys. And we have found out over and over and over that trails and recreation are huge. You know, that's, that's one of the major things that people want to see improved. And so um, Conifer Area Council has, has worked with, with the Conifer Recreation Coalition and a lot with Jefferson County Open Space to make sure that some things um, are happening. <coughs> and here tonight to tell us a little bit about some of the things that are happening, um, Tom Hobie, who is the Director of Parks and Open Space with Jefferson County Open Space, and Amy Ito, who is the Planning and Stewardship Manager for Jefferson County Open Space. And they're going to talk about some of the things that we're working on up here. Tom? Great. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, thanks for all for being here tonight. Appreciate you having us. Um, we've got lots of great things going on throughout the county, and in particular, this part of the county. So the first thing I wanted to let you know, um, we were approached uh, a while back um, by a club, a group uh, attempting to do some improvements at Conifer High School, asking the county if they would help sponsor a Great Outdoors Colorado grant. Uh, we did that um, because of the efforts of the club in raising lots of local dollars. We were able to get, I think, $280,000 from GoCo for that project. Um, so um, great work by um, the, uh, the local group club to get that uh, lighting project done and some other improvements to the sports fields there. Um, real quickly, I just wanted to tell you about something uh, along the lines of what Shirley was just talking about. How many of you know about the North Fork Trail? Great, awesome. So we opened the North Fork Trail after spending about five years building it. It's about a nine and a half mile long trail that connects Reynolds Park down to the South Platte. And just a little piece down the road, you can jump on the Colorado Trail and you can get all the way over to Pine Valley Ranch Park um, in Pine Grove. So it's a tremendous uh, addition to our trail system. Uh, if you haven't been out there, I highly recommend it. It probably doesn't hold very much snow because it's south facing and it's got a lot of de decomposed granite on it. So it's probably a fairly winter friendly trail. So um, let me just talk, uh, the next topic is Journey Church. Um, Conifer Area Council submitted a proposal to Jeffco Open Space for us to consider acquisition of that particular site. So let me talk real quickly about our proposal process. So actually anyone can submit a proposal to us. A neighbor, the property owner themselves, an interested group, in this case the Conifer Area Council, one of our staff members can propose it. So anybody can do that and then we go through an evaluation process. We look at the land and compare it to, look at it in relation to our open space acquisition criteria. And that's a fairly thorough evaluation process, process that Amy and her group goes through. So that's a little bit about proposals. The second piece is that we have a couple of policies that guide and govern us. And when I say policies, I mean think these are, these are requirements that are adopted by the Board of County Commissioners. So one of them is that we only work with willing sellers. Another one is we only pay up to fair market value. And another one is that if something happens to be in the planning and zoning process, whether it's being brought forward for development or otherwise, we cannot engage with that property owner. That is the case with Journey Church currently. They have a zoning violation that basically takes us out of play until that zoning violation is resolved. 
Once that is resolved, we can engage in some discussions with them. So really, we're, we're kind of at a, a, a holding place, waiting until uh, that zoning violation is resolved. That said, um, I just did want to just point out that there were a couple different reasons that Conifer Council suggested we look at this property. The first one is, um, can you use the, cur the pointer in? The first one is to attempt to uh, connect the high school to Flying J Ranch Park through this property. And, and um, you probably know that many students uh, make that connection today, uh, basically across private property. Um, the high school being just at the bottom part of the map here. This is the, uh, the actual Journey Church property and the Flying J Ranch property. So that was one reason. The second reason was it has a very large home that was built in the 60s, about 5,000 square feet, that might serve as a community gathering place. And you heard Mimi talk about that a little bit earlier. And the third reason is that it has quite a, a nice meadow that is adjacent to uh, Flying J Ranch Park across the highway from the Yellow Barn. So those are the attributes of the property that um, Conifer Area Council um, uh, wanted us to take a look at. Again, uh, we won't be able to take this any further than we have until the zoning violation is resolved. So that's Journey Church. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about Beaver Ranch. Um, some years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, Jefferson County Open Space purchased Beaver Ranch uh, as a community park for the Conifer community. Um, with the understanding that it would be operated by a nonprofit organization at no cost to the county. Uh, Beaver Ranch is a former camp, summer camp, has a lot of old buildings. Um, and the board of directors, the nonprofit board of directors that have, have been operating Beaver Ranch for, for all these years have done a really good job cobbling things together. But they found themselves in this mode of continuing to try and sustain something that isn't all that sustainable. It's a lot of old buildings. They wind up bringing in a lot of uses that aren't necessarily community uses just to make ends meet. Um, renting cabins to folks that come up from Denver and so forth, which is great for the local economy, but we're just not really certain that that's serving the community need. We hear a lot of things anecdotally from the community that we would like it to be this or we would like it to be that. So, recently as part of our local grant program, our nonprofit grant program, I should say, we uh, awarded the, the uh, Beaver Ranch uh, Board a grant to do a very specific master plan or site plan for Beaver Ranch with the understanding that there will be a lot of community engagement and input so we get so we get it right so we really understand what you all want Beaver Ranch to be someday how it will best serve you uh, and then and then I think we can start putting the pieces together using some of the, the work from Project Place that Mimi talked about to start pulling together the resources to get whatever it is you want Beaver Ranch to be um, I will just say this um, go to the next slide. Uh, Beaver Ranch is actually about the same size as Flying J uh, uh, Ranch. Um, we wanted to just illustrate um, the, the notion about Journey Church being a community gathering place. That's why we bought Beaver Ranch. And it's roughly the same distance from the kind of the center of the conifer area to Beaver Ranch as it is to the Journey Church site. So we're going to want to look at that and consider that in both, both of the things that I just talked about, be it Journey Church as when that zoning violation comes, comes uh, is resolved, uh, as well as uh, Beaver Ranch Master Plan. So look for that. That will be coming. Um, we're, we're hoping to work through that fairly expeditiously, that is the Beaver Ranch plan, and have something in a year's time that we can start working on. So I want to turn it over to Amy, and she's going to talk to you about another project we have going. Thanks, Tom. So um, 
Thanks for having us this evening. About a year ago, we adopted a master plan for specifically Jefferson County open space. And it lays out for us strategies for the next five years. So we're into year one of that. One of the things that we did is take a look at some of the water basins and some of the regions within the county. And we looked at four of them specifically. We held what we called a um, uh, cafe to actually talk about what partnerships are available, what might we do in various parts of the county. And one of the things that we found, thanks Tom, is that um, what you see in a large pink um, block is actually a study that we had done for our master plan by a group called the Colorado Natural Heritage Program, identifying an area of one of the highest biodiversities for them within a potential conservation area in the very southern part of the county before we interface with the U.S. Forest Service. So we've been looking at that. We've been talking to our partners about regions that we should focus on. We're so lucky that we have such a large county with so much rich wealth of, of opportunity for conservation, and yet we realized we needed to focus. And so with the recent conservation cafe, our determination was we should focus in this southern area of the county. One of the things that you're going to find is that as we're starting to identify that area of focus, we were originally calling it kind of Deer Creek, which was near three of our large parks, Deer Creek, South Valley, and Hildebrand near Chatfield, and as we looked more closely at that slide prior of the natural heritage opportunities, what we realized is the focus should really be in the area that we're showing there with the, the blocked out area, which really includes a lot of pine. It takes the southern part of Staunton State Park. Um, it looks very closely at the interface with the Forest Service, with the Pike National Forest. It really incorporates a lot of local, state, federal agencies, partnerships, and for us, this is an opportunity to look big picture. Where are there regional trail corridors? Who can we partner with to leverage some amazing conservation efforts? Where are there habitat and wildlife movements? And so as you see, we've got arrows on the northern part of this conservation strategy network area interfacing with the conifer area, and that's why we're here presenting it this evening. There's so much work being done in the conifer area. You've heard about a couple things with Project Place, Beaver Ranch, obviously the Conferee of Council is a huge advocate. What we want to do is interface closely as then we hone in more specifically on the area just south. Um, so that was something we wanted to share with you. This will be a project that takes us multiple years, um, and it doesn't mean we won't focus on the rest of the county, but this is an area where we really see some incredible opportunities for this larger scale opportunity for uh, cooperation and networking. So we're here this evening. I've got the master plan. We can speak more about this. And thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Amy and Tom. We've, um, we've worked a lot with Open Space. They've just been fantastic to work with. So thank you so much. OK, um, next, Minor Ranch House, the barn, and the outbuildings. Um, there's, we're just going to have Susie Morris with um, Chisholm, Conifer Historical Society and Museum. <laughs> um, so Susie Morris is going to talk, just give a little bit of an update about the Meyer Ranch property. And it looks like we have some Meyers here tonight, so we are so grateful for that. There, we have um, Sharon, Cara, and Norm Jr. in the audience this evening, and they might be available for questions if you have any from them. So I am Susie Morris, president of the Conifer Historical Society, and I only have five minutes, so I'm going to fly through this. Um, we're here tonight because I'd like to do an update for you on what we've called the Meyer Museum Project. We have a small board of dedicated uh, board members and volunteers, and uh, our mission has been to preserve, I'll shorten it, preserve and share the history of the conifer area. And the property is now for sale. So here's, uh, here's an overview of the entire property. Um, not sure 
if you could make out, I did what I have here is that's an overview of the entire property. And what's for sale is the area at the bottom of that map, which is a triangle, 10.6 acres. It has the Midway House, the garage, the McIntyre barn, the hangar, sheds, and the Lubin Blakesley cabin, which was moved to that property um, about 10 years ago. So I'm going to give you a real quick history. I, there may not be anyone in this room that doesn't understand the historical significance of this property, but I'm just going to run through it really quickly. So in 1969, John McIntyre homesteaded the property and built a cabin, which is no longer there. The wood for the McIntyre barn was cut in 1870, and the University of Arizona did a study on it. Uh, the McIntyre barn is very significant. It's a uh, very early wooden peg hand-hewn construction. And that's the McIntyre barn. In 1874, the General Land Office granted the homestead to McIntyre. In 1882, Rambo bought the homestead. And in 1889, the Queen Anne-style farmhouse was built. And uh, there's the Rambo family. With, like they like to do, lined up all their possessions out in the front yard and took a picture. So um, this is just to illustrate that uh, this is the first floor, the original first floor, and the second floor. And that is just to illustrate that the house is, there's a lot of rooms, and there are no large spaces for meetings and things like that. In 1912, the ranch and the Midway House were sold to the Ralph Kirkpatrick family, and they had it until the 1940s, and um, during those war years, there were other owners. In 1950, Norman Ethel Meyer purchased the ranch, and in 1959, they purchased an additional 140 acres of the Lubin property, and that's where, uh, kind of where the King Super Shopping Center is. Um, in 1990, the Midway House was added to the National Register of Historic Places. In 2001, Norm signed a deed of conservation easement with Jefferson County Open Space. Um, and I wanted to share with you, since the property is for sale, these are some of the prohibited uses. And I'm going to just go through this quickly because I can share this with you later if you're interested. So there's several prohibited uses, and um, you know I think that would be a little bit of a concern for a museum, and um, it outright eliminates a lot of commercial use, or any commercial use, actually. In 2010, we signed, the Conifer Historical Society signed a letter of agreement with Norm Sr. and his son Norm, who's here tonight, to conduct a historic structure assessment and an economic feasibility study. Um, and also we had um, right of first refusal when the property is sold. And actually Jefferson County Open Space has the first right of refusal, but apparently um, we didn't all know that when we were signing this letter. In 2011, uh, we received a grant from the State Historic Fund to pay for the historic structure assessment of the property. In 2012, Jerome Associates presented the results of that historic structure assessment. It's a big binder full of um, all the details on the structure assessment. In 2013, the State Historic Fund um, gave us another grant for a museum feasibility study. Now, let me flip ahead here because I... So what we have with the whoops, go back. What we have is a uh, small team of dedicated volunteers, as I said, and um, it's going to take a large committee. If the community is interested in purchasing this property, it's going to take quite a few people to work through all the details. I have made several calls to History Colorado and the State Historic Fund. There are multiple funding options for us. There are multiple grants. They can be combined. 
Um, but it's going to take a lot of people to work through that. So is there a possibility to purchase the home? Yes. Um, is the Conifer Historical Society going to do that all by themselves? No. <laughs> so, um, but we do have all the information, and as I say, it's going to take a lot of people to make that happen. Um, while we were working on, or finishing, the feasibility study for Meyer Ranch, we were given the deed to the Little White Schoolhouse, also known as the Conifer Junction School. And this has been listed on the county, the state, and now the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the Conifer Historical Society has been doing programs and exhibits since 2006. And these are many of them, quite a variety. And our next program is a free program on March 1st. It's a tribute to Norm uh, Senior. So that, I think that covers it. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I think everyone here agrees that the Meyer Ranch property is just amazing. Coming down that hill into Conifer and seeing that yellow house is, it's special. So I think it's something that we you know, really need to get behind if, if that's what we want to do. So. Um, well, I just want to thank all of the speakers tonight. Um, they are sticking around, most of them, and they are here for questions, for comments. They've got displays, they've got brochures, they've got tickets. Um, the Mountain Area Home and Garden Show is coming up in April, April 25th and 26th, so they've got tickets back there. The Rotary St. Patty's Party is March 14th, I, think, I believe. Um, and there's tickets back there for that. As you know, the Stage Door Theater um, is presenting um, Sweet Charity, and so Punky at the back table, the middle, middle table back there, has the $2 coupons if you would like to, to go see that. Um, the trails table is right there where Punky is also, and um, our trails team has just done amazing um, things. They've got maps back there, and they can show you all that they have done, so please go back and talk to them. Um, Main Street Loop Project, we've got that started. And we would love to get volunteers to help with that. We talked a lot about that at our last meeting. Um, you can talk to Lauren, who's in the orange shirt back here. She's also representing the Intermountain Humane Society. So you can talk to her about those two different things. Um, there's a lot of other nonprofits and RTD and CDOT and Open Space and Conifer Library and Public, you know, um, Project Place. Um, a lot of people here to talk to. So please do that. Um, and I would like to again thank Marcy's Automotive for their community support of tonight's Conifer Area Council Town Hall meeting. And also Big O Tire um, actually has been bringing or um, purchasing um, the water for the meeting. So we would like to recognize them because that's, that's, we all need water, I, I think, you know. Um, okay. So, um, and most of all, thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you on April 15th, which is the next town hall meeting right here. Thank you.